Hello there, and welcome to the very first episode for World War II Boffin. For this first entry, we're going to take a look at some of the early origins of and events connected to World War II. The period that we're concerned with is the end of the First World War, so end of 1918 through to the early months of 1919 going through to the end of 1929. Just a quick official note before we begin, any opinions expressed in this episode, unless I specify that I'm quoting from an original source, uh, the opinions are entirely my own and do not represent any official organisation. So without further ado, off we go. Times immediately following the end of the Great War in November 1918 and into the early 1920s were a turbulent and uncertain time for Germany. The Treaty of Versailles, now judged to have been overly harsh on Germany, weighed heavily on the people and very much played a part in what was to happen over the course of the next 20 years. The treaty put the blame for the war on Germany, stripped it of vast amounts of its territory along with which its people, and imposed colossal reparations payments that, when worked out, would not be fully repaid until the 1980s. In retrospect, the treaty, rather than being a presentation of peace after an especially devastating and traumatic war, comes across as a bitter act of vengeance. It's not difficult to gain at least some understanding of why the Allies seemed to want to punish Germany, however. Casualties suffered in the conflict were on a scale that had never been seen before. Britain, France, Russia and the United States suffered a combined total of approximately 3,650,000 combat dead. France and Russia alone lost over a million each and approximately 4 million wounded. On the opposite side, Germany suffered somewhere in the region of 2 million killed in combat alone. Battles such as Verdun, the Somme, Passchendaele alongside others have gone down in history as some of the bloodiest and most horrific in history. To say that the experience left those who participated in it and survived to see its end traumatised is something of an understatement. It perhaps cannot be accurately expressed in words what the First World War did to people, physically and emotionally, and attempts to understand what they went for will ultimately prove to be somewhat futile, as unless such a thing is experienced firsthand, full understanding is just not possible. You combine this with a harsh treaty and blame being solely fixed on one belligerent, in hindsight it was a concoction that left Europe balancing on the edge of a precipice, eventually tipping over the edge into turmoil once more. Versailles required Germany and her allies to accept responsibility for causing all the loss and damage during the war. Now this was Article 231, known as the War Guilt Clause. Now the word guilt was not specifically used, but the article was used as a legal basis for compelling Germany to pay reparations. Reparations were for the loss and damage that the Allied and Associate governments and their nationals had been subjected to as a result of aggression by Germany and her allies. This article perhaps caused the most bitterness and anger amongst the German population out of all the others within the treaty. Forcing Germany to accept complete responsibility was seen as a national humiliation, especially as they had suffered one of the highest death rates. However, the leaders of the Allies saw it as only a necessary legal basis in order to receive compensation from Germany, so they couldn't understand such anger or the reasons for it. The underestimation on the part of the Allies of the German nation's reaction and depth of loathing over it was dangerous and ultimately proved to be fatal. It further aggravated Germany, and Hitler's later ability to reverse the treaty and effectively vanquish the war guilt was a huge reason as to why he was revered so passionately by the people and head up as this messianic type figure, as he basically removed their country's humiliation and returned a sense of pride to them. Understanding the depth of the anger at this particular article in June 1919 aids the understanding of why Hitler appeals so much to so many and why they bound and pledged themselves to him. It's one of the reasons why he managed to achieve divine-like status in their eyes. The Allies, in all probability, did not realise how inappropriately written Article 231 was, or the lack of clarity as to what was actually meant by it, i.e. simply a legal means of extracting reparations. Their failure to realise this, though, eventually proved disastrous. They did not take Germany's reaction or grievances as seriously as, in hindsight, they should have done. But there were those on the Allied side, even at the time, who viewed the treaty as being too harsh and even counterproductive, especially from an economical point of view. It was judged to be a very brutal supposed peace that totally crushed the enemy. Unfortunately, warnings such as these were not heeded and the treaty went ahead as it was. It did not, however, leave Germany permanently weakened, but instead provide a f provided a fuel for stoking later hostilities and a desire to regain former strength. And again, Hitler's ability to seemingly achieve this endeared him even more to the country. 
Neither Germany nor Austria and Hungary, its chief allies, were allowed to take part in the negotiations. The fate and indeed shape of the defeated nations was all decided in their absence and without any possibility of proposals, input or negotiation from their side. This could only add to the anger and bitterness and it could be said that Germany had its dignity stripped from and ripped up in front of her. But disunity amongst the main ally powers involved in the creation of the treaty on how Germany should ultimately be treated also didn't help. Britain's Prime Minister at the time, David Lloyd George, whilst not wanting to come across as being soft on Germany, privately thought that whilst she should be punished, it should not be left destitute as he saw the country as a barrier to the threat of communism which was rising. The French, on the other hand, simply believed that Germany should be punished severely for starting the war and in such a way that they could never begin another one, which is extremely ironic as the treaty helped to cause exactly what it was supposed to defend against two decades later. Significant destruction in its own territories alongside a death toll second only to Russia in numeracy on the Allied side means that France's reaction and stance should really not be a great surprise, if any. They also shared a border with Germany, so a means to weaken a former enemy in order to protect themselves against future dangers was an opportunity that France was intent on seizing and executing to their own benefit. France, more than any of the other Allied powers, pushed extremely hard for Germany to be punished, almost continuously, for the war. As a result, this humiliating attitude towards their country remained in the minds of the German people and contributed to the gradual feeling of loathing towards France that was to emerge over the coming years. America was left shocked at the brutal savagery and devastation that it had witnessed during the war, prompting it to adopt a policy of isolation alongside the decision never to get involved or be dragged into European affairs in the future. Such conflicting views and priorities could not result in a particularly stable and strong peace treaty in the long run, so overall it didn't bode well for Europe. Instead, it left behind a peace that was extremely shaky and a continent that was only really ever a small step away from imploding all over again. All that would be needed were the right circumstances combined with the right personality to set it off. Large portions of territory were also taken from Germany as part of the treaty, and that was a bitter pill to swallow. Alsace-Lorraine, for example, was given to France. Eupen Malmedy, a predominantly German-speaking region in eastern Belgium, was given over to Belgium entirely. Germany had to recognise the independence of Czechoslovakia and see part of the province to Upper Silesia, which was located in Poland with small parts in the Czech Republic and since 1871 had been part of the German Empire. Poland is perhaps one of the most significant parts of the treaty, seeing how it was the German march into that country that kicked off an even bigger conflict 20 years later. Portions of Upper Silesia were ceded to Poland, along with the province of Poznan and Pomerania in northern Poland, again a part of Germany, it was transferred in the most part to the newly created Second Polish Republic, basically the interwar, interwar Poland, the country between the First and Second World Wars, so from 1918 to 1939, creating the Polish Corridor, which provided access to the Baltic Sea and with it its port, Danzig, therefore dividing the bulk of Germany from East Prussia. In all, 20,000 square miles was given to Poland at the expense of Germany, with a great number of ethnic Germans going with it who deeply resented being separated from Germany, especially with the, within the free city of Danzig, something that Hitler would exploit later. Germany was stripped of her colonies, which were then divided via a League of Nations mandate between France, Belgium, Britain, Japan, which was given all German possessions in the Pacific north of the equator, and Australia, who took the possessions south of the equator. In all, Germany was stripped of some 25,000 square miles of territory and 7 million of its people. Now, militarily, Germany's army was restricted to no more than 100,000 men, conscription was abolished, it could not have an air force, the navy had limitations imposed on it, paramilitary forces were forbidden, the country was prohibited from the arms trade and could not manufacture or stockpile chemical weapons, tanks, armoured cars and military aircraft. The Rhineland, an area which lay between France and Germany and had become a key industrial region of the latter, was to be demilitarised. This and other provisions were intended to make Germany incapable of offensive action and certainly left it severely weakened and restricted in a military sense, virtually disintegrated. Post-dissolution of the Imperial Army, the Reichswehr, in 1918, saw the German military forces consist of, consist of irregular paramilitaries, mostly right-wing Freikorps, or Freikorps. Now, these were groups composed of veterans of the Great War. Freikorps units were formally disbanded in 1920, but they continued to exist in underground groups. On the 1st of January 1921, the new Reichswehr was created. Inefficient armour and no air support, terms under Versailles, 
Vassal, sorry, meant limited combat abilities. The head of the Reichswehr, Hans von Secht, stated that the army was not loyal to the Democratic Republic and would only defend it if it was in their interests. The treaty also stipulated that Germany was forbidden to unite with Austria. June 1919, Germany was told that if they didn't sign the treaty, then the Allies would resume war on them and invade. The new German government attempted to get certain articles withdrawn before signing the treaty, including the War Guilt Clause, Article 231, which demanded Germany to take responsibility for the war. But the Allies would have none of this and remain defiant, responding that Germany was to either sign the treaty or face invasion. The new government capitulated, and in all honesty, they couldn't really do anything else, all things considered. And on the 28th of June that year, the anniversary of the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, which had triggered the First World War, the treaty was signed. And that was that. Or so the Allies thought, anyway. In all, you could say that Germany as a country, and psychologically, was ripped to shreds and left devastated via Versailles. Perhaps in a way even more so than the actual fighting had left it, and it is little wonder that this caused such deep resentment and bitterness amongst Germans, and the extent of this left them easily open to manipulation by someone who could seemingly right all of the wrongs that had been inflicted on the country, and restore it to its previous greatness, if not beyond that, which would instil a sense of satisfied revenge. But it also didn't help that the Allies couldn't definitely all agree on how exactly Germany was to be dealt with. Britain, on the one hand, believed that whilst it should be punished, it should also be allowed to exist in such a way that it could be a defence against the spread of communism, sorry, communism, which was what was feared most. France wanted it to be served severe punishment, smashed and weakened as much as possible to protect their borders. And America, like Britain, believed that while there should be punishment, there should also be efforts to work towards reconciliation and rebuilding Europe rather than acts of revenge. The three big allies, Russia, had gone out of the war in November 1917 as a result of the internal revolution, so that left the big three as Britain, France and the United States. They did not unite as they should have done and did not work together enough towards a common and balanced goal and the treaty was stuck together in bits rather than sealed as a whole. If they had come together properly, then perhaps history would have turned out differently and peace could have endured. Their failure to unite strongly could therefore be seen as a contributing factor to the eventual collapse of peace once more. Although in retrospect Versailles was overly harsh and very significant to later events, it is in part understandable why the Allies, France in particular, were seemingly hell-bent on some sort of revenge and punishing Germany for the war. Four years of conflict had left all the countries psychologically shattered, millions dead and had maimed, physically and emotionally, many of those who had survived it. Their task and focus now was to pick up the pieces, rebuild and ensure peace remained in Europe. However, this rebuilding was being done around a very, very shaky peace and there were those who very early on did not believe that it would last, that it couldn't last with the terms of Versailles being one reason why. French Marshal Ferdinand Foch, who thought that Germany had been treated too leniently, stated that the treaty wasn't peace, it was simply an armistice for 20 years and how right he turned out to be. The League of Nations was set up to keep further conflict at bay and maintain the world peace. In the end, it failed in its task with grave consequences. It was what this treaty did psychologically to Germany that really comes to the fore and was particularly significant to later events. The resentment, anger and bitterness generated by Versailles is of great importance. The treaty also contributed to the birth of the stab in the back myth that the Nazis would also manipulate to, sorry, manipulate to great advantage. This myth basically stated that Germany had not been defeated militarily, but had been betrayed by the politicians and civilians at home, leading to the war being lost. The German army being apparently unbeaten and still in the fight led to the growth of suspicions that something else had taken place behind the scenes and had brought about Germany's collapse. She had been betrayed from within. Someone was to blame, and this suspicion fell primarily on the politicians who had signed the Treaty of Versailles, those who had instigated unrest and strikes in the critical military industries back home as this had led to inadequate supplies and materials reaching the soldiers, preventing them from being able to, con to continue the fight, communists, those who opposed German nationalism, socialists, and those most greatly implicated, the Jews, who were accused of not supporting the war and had therefore helped to sell out Germany to its enemies. This alone is an outright lie based on record of how many Jews fought for Germany throughout the war and made equally great sacrifices alongside their fellow countrymen, which was conveniently forgotten by Hitler and co. It was the unpatriotic elements that had lost it for Germany. 
The fact that in November 1918 the German army was still standing on French and Belgian soil and the Allied armies had not set foot on German home soil contributed to the, to the suspicion that Germany had been betrayed by other parties. There was a search for someone to blame, which was found in those previously mentioned. But in reality, although the German army was still on enemy soil, it was out of reserves and being overwhelmed by late 1918 with its strate strategic position significantly weakened. The Hundred Days Offensive between August and November 1918 by the Allies resulted in them gaining huge amounts of territory at Germany's expense, and the arrival of large numbers of fresh troops from the US was a decisive factor. Nevertheless, the train of thought grew that the war had not been lost on the battlefield, it had been betrayed on the home front. As far as the betrayal of the politicians goes by sign in Versailles, they couldn't really do anything else but sign. The Allies were threatening further devastation by war if they didn't. President Friedrich Ebert of the new coalition government at the time had consulted Field Marshal von Hindenburg on whether the army would be capable of resistance in the event of further war with the Allies. As if there was any chance at all that the army could make a stand, then Ebert was prepared to recommend not signing. Hindenburg, though, stated that the army would not be able to resume war even on a limited scale. It would be in an untenable position in the event of renewed hostilities. So the new government really didn't have any other choice but to sign, although Ebert's comments to returning veterans that no enemy has vanquished you could only have fuel to the fire of, susp fire of suspicion. An attempt to save the country from further destruction was twisted into an act of treachery. Despite what was later spouted by the NSDAP, or the Nazis, the signing of the treaty was not a stab in the back. It was simply an attempt to salvage something from a wreck and to prevent further death and destruction that would come if Germany did not agree would perhaps even lead to Germany's annihilation. Times were uncertain after the end of the war and the Treaty of Versailles, especially within Germany, a time bomb that was waiting for the moment to explode. Now within these uncertain times, Adolf Hitler begins to make his entrance. He's involved in another event of significance connected to World War II that takes place in the first few years after the end of the First World War. In November 1923, he attempts a coup in Munich, an illegal attempt to take over the German government, in order to seize power there, thereby taking control of the state of Bavaria. The Munich coup was part of a larger plan and meant to be the first step on the road that would eventually, lead, would eventually end sorry, with marching against the Weimar, Weimar government and taking power in Berlin, and with it, the rest of the country. But Hitler miscalculates and misjudges a number of key things which leads to the coup collapsing. Sixteen Nazis and four state police officers were were killed as a result of a clash between the putschists and soldiers alongside the police in the streets of Munich, as Hitler attempted his own march on Rome against the government of the Weimar Republic. Hitler flees the scene, but is tracked down and arrested, and stands trial in February the following year, 1924, for treason. His impressive oratory skills displayed during the trial as he turns this to his advantage and uses it as a stage to project himself and his ideas and make himself heard, enable him to strike a chord with many people both within and outside Germany. The trial should have been the last that history saw of Hitler, but his words and the passion with which he spoke them meant that that, that would ultimately not be the case. He was found guilty and sentenced to five years in prison. He would actually serve only just over eight months before being released for good behaviour. One major lesson that Hitler learned from the putsch was that attempting to take power by force and violence would ultimately not succeed. He realised that in order to properly secure power, he would have to do it by legal means, the democratic way, which is ironic due to the fact that he hated democracy. He would need to make it so the German people voted him in through their own choice and free will. It was to be the German people who would hand Hitler the power that he wanted, and they would do so willingly and with enthusiasm. Germany's attempt at a democracy occurred between 1919 and 1933 with the Weimar Republic. It had a nervous, turbulent and uncertain beginning with the threat of all-out revolution, two attempted putches, and a great deal of discontent among the German people over their situation and the consequences of being blamed solely for the war, not surprisingly, and particularly during the first month, sorry, first few months after the end of the war in November 1918. In particular, there was a deep bitterness and loathing towards France, who had, of course, at Versailles wanted to see Germany sue to be punished. French occupation of areas such as Frankfurt and Darmstadt in 1919 prompted outrage, and only increased the already existing hatred of, of the French and to a dangerous degree. The German, the German people's wrath was particularly directed at the fact that the French had used black troops, an indication already of the increasing racism that was to follow over the next few years. 
It seemed to Germany that France was attempting to split the country. As a result of such a supposed action, many people were willing to witness a military putsch if it would produce any sort of opportunity to, to deal with the French. Militarists, of course, would only encourage this feeling to aid their efforts of seeing a putsch become a reality, which it briefly did in 1920 and 1923, although both attempts were ultimately failures. Germany's intense bitterness and anger towards the French in particular out of all the Allies should not be underestimated, especially as there was an opinion that the French had twisted Britain's arm on many things and was forcing them into agreement with at least most of their arguments and demands when it came to treatment of Germany. The Reichswehr showed some signs of violence towards foreigners in those early days, evidenced by an incident involving a British journalist who was ill-treated by some of the troops in the Ruhr district. After, in their view, his attitude towards them was considered to be contemptuous and rude, and plus he had spoken of the Russian Red Army as good, brave fellows. Early attempts to demobilise soldiers only added to the trouble. Outside of the army, there was simply no work for these men and nowhere to send them. With seemingly very little hope on the horizon for the future and reflections on the war coupled with the belief of a betrayal being the real reason why they had lost, it can be imagined instilled despair, anger and the want of some sort of action to see it righted. A move against the government in an atmosphere and tensions such as this would not be too difficult to encourage and was a very real danger, especially against a government that they believed had thrown them out onto the street and abandoned them. The only other question was whether the putsch would come from the left or the right and the fear of the government was of the breakout of a civil war. What would happen to Germany? At this point, the answer to that question was not certain and not easy to find. The fear of Bolshevism was also not to be underestimated, although was, there was still a good number of people who saw this as perhaps the only way of escaping Versailles by uniting against France with Russian Bolshevism. A notion such as this would have horrified the likes of Hitler and Cohen and only increased their determination to act, act against and destroy Bolshevism completely once and for all. It was a question of saving Germany. One of the opinions from abroad was that the only way that Germany could save itself was to find a way of providing adequate employment for its surplus population, otherwise the circumstances would only worsen and all-out revolution and civil war would surely be only a matter of time. The hungry needed to be fed and the naked to be clothed in order to remove such a danger. It was a time of great fear for both the government and the people. In his first major political statement in September 1919, Hitler stated that the Republic owed its birth not to the united national will of the German people, but to the cunning exploitation of a series of circumstances which combined to produce a deep general discontent. There was much discussion over and arguments for easing the Allied blockade which had been put in place during the war to, in order to help alleviate the food crisis in Germany which could only be of benefit to the Allies, especially as far as propaganda went, propaganda, sorry, went and for maintaining order. But there was debate as to how much food was actually needed, with Germany doubling the Allies' estimates. Decisions needed to be made quickly, though. Need in Germany was extremely urgent, whilst there was also the need to prevent anarchy. However, the Allies were morally bound to supply Allied and liberated countries ahead of Germany and could not relieve the latter, unless there were ample supplies for the former first. Britain, in particular, was in a dilemma wanted to aid Germany in order to prevent disaster and havoc, but at the same time feeling morally bound to agreements made with the other allies. Food was especially in dire need for women and children, many of whom, according to the Germans, were now dying as a result of mal malnourishment and reports by British authorities and delegates who travelled to Germany seemed to support this statement. There appeared to be a general consensus and fear, both at home and abroad, that imminent starvation as a result of the food crisis would encourage the German population to turn to Bolshevism in despair, in the hope that it would provide an answer to their plight if it seemed that nothing else would. This could well become the case if the German government and the Allies separately and together did not move and work fast to save a population as well as a country that was stood on the edge of a knife. According to a speech given by Hitler in a Munich beer cellar in October 1920, he for one didn't believe that Weimar was capable of restoring national pride, that they couldn't be proud of their leader Friedrich Ebert, the social democrat president of the Republic. In fact, judging by the reported reaction to these statements from his audience, it was laughable to think otherwise, and his opinion was shared enthusiastically, enthusiast enthusiastically sorry, by many others. The Republic had got its name from the fact that the assembly that adopted Germany's first democratic constitution met in Weimar, a city in Thuringia in central Germany, hence Weimar Republic. Weimar saw two presidents and 15 chancellors during its existence. The 16th chancellor was Hitler, and when Hindenburg, the World War I field marshal and second president of the Republic, died in August 1934, Hitler combined the office of both chancellor and president, which left him all-powerful and created the Führer. 
A couple of the chancellors served more than one term, such as Hermann Muller and Wilhelm Marx, who served two terms each. Marx's two terms combined made him the longest serving chancellor of Weimar at three years and two months. The others lasted between two months and two years. One of Marx's successes had been to bring Germany into the League of Nations. The Republic got off to a very nervy and turbulent start with its future greatly uncertain. It witnessed revolution at its beginning, the German Revolution, November 1918 to August 1919, which was caused in part by the heavy burdens that the German population had suffered during the war, and these led to a demand for the end of hostilities, which grew louder, and one of the results was the end of the war in 1918, when the German politicians surrendered in order to save the country from completely collapsing and being swallowed up by revolution and disorder. Weimar had two great weaknesses, however, but they weren't recognised at the time. These were proportional representation and Article 48 of the Constitution. Proportional representation is where instead of voting for an individual, individual MP, Germans voted for a party. Each party was then allocated seats in the Reichstag, the German Parliament, reflecting exactly the number of people who had voted for it, i.e. if one party received 10% of the overall vote, then overall vote, overall vote sorry, then they would get 10% of the seats in the Reichstag. Sounded good but it led to lots of tiny parties, none of whom were strong enough to get a majority, and therefore no government could get its laws passed in the Reichstag. Article 48, in an emergency, this meant that the president didn't need the agreement of the Reichstag, but could issue decrees. But the article didn't stipulate what an emergency was exactly, and this eventually became a backdoor for Hitler to take power legally. One of the big fears in the early years of the Republic was Bolshevism. Berlin was regarded as the true centre of danger in regards to Bolshevism. The three main reasons as to why. One, its mixed population, including large numbers of Slavs and Jews. Two, the proximity of Russia and direct Russian influence. And three, the critical nature of the food and labour situation. It was a simmering cauldron of discontent. Receptivity to Bolshevism was fuelled by the present food situation and the health implications that came with being underfed along with unemployment. The middle and governmental classes also claimed that another factor was the delay in peace negotiations and the indefinite prolonging of the armistice. Don't forget Versailles wasn't signed until June 1919, seven months after the fighting had ended. These classes were insistent that the petty annoyances of the armistice conditions were rousing such fury amongst the German people that it would inevitably lead to Bolshevism and breed a spirit of hate and revenge more terrible than anything mankind had ever experienced. Author of a report on the internal situation in Germany at that time did not think that the masses would pay much attention to the peace negotiations and conditions if they had food and work. Was he under did he underestimate how the German population did truly feel? Or maybe he was attempting optimism? Or a bit of both? Mention here already of a growing bitterness and hatred towards France. The most serious effect of the delay, though, was on the government. Until negotiations had been settled and the German government knew for definite what it had to work with, it could not do anything for the people. It couldn't produce food, work or peace. As a result, the German people would turn to the lights of Bolshevism in their despair and in a desire to see action finally be taken by some quarter. The delay in settling the peace negotiations resulted in a delay for the government to try and put some sort of strategy in place for putting the country back together again, to give its people what they needed. The government's hands were tied and were awaiting the actions of other powers before their hands could be released in some way. For many, the best weapons to use against the threat of Bolshevism were food and employment. Although in the early months of 1919, another pressing factor was thrown into the mix, and that is the need for the peace negotiations to be finally settled so that Germany would know what its fate was to be at the hands of the Allies, or put another way, for the German people to be put out of their misery. The question was raised externally that the German government might be using Bolshevism to frighten the Allies to either extract better peace terms or use as an excuse for a revival of militarism. Answer? Not entirely untrue, however it was being practiced only by a small party of reactionaries who had no influence in Germany whatsoever. As for the possibility of renewal of militarism, this was deemed to be entirely out of the question and for many years to come. It was claimed that one sentiment in Germany that was absolutely true and universal was the hatred of the soldiers and sailors for their officers and everything that was associated with, mi with militarism. Any revival of that spirit or system was absolutely unthinkable, it was said. Settled conditions could not return to Germany until some sort of peace had been officially signed. Uncertainty fanned the flames of discontent even more. It was deemed essential that the current German government receive definite support from the Allies along with their cooperation to allow ample supplies of, supplies of food to reach the country, finally. 
January 1919 saw an increase in armed attempts in Berlin to establish communism, which were headed by the Spartacist League. The Spartacist League was a Marxist revolutionary movement that came into being during World War I, and it was named after Spartacus, leader of the largest slave rebellion of the Roman Republic. Two of its most prominent founders were Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg. The League was highly active during the German Revolution of November 1918 to August 1919, and this revolution had been caused in part by the heavy burdens that the German population had suffered during the war, and these had led to a demand for the end of hostilities which grew louder towards November 1918, and one of the results of which was the end of the war, that November when the German politicians surrendered in order to save the country from completely collapsing and being swallowed up by revolution and disorder. The stab in the back myth also has deep roots within the revolution, as under this belief, revolution at home had betrayed the German army to defeat. The revolutionaries at home had attacked the undefeated army from the rear and turned an almost certain victory into a defeat. Despite the German army's gallant efforts to continue the fight, it was ultimately betrayed by the civilians back home. So the conspiracy theory went. January 1919 saw what became known as the Spartacist Uprising, a general strike accompanied by armed battles from the 4th to the 15th of January that year, as a part of the revolution. It was primarily a power struggle between the Social Democratic Party and the radical communists of the Communist Party of Germany, who were being led by Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg. The uprising was eventually put down by the paramilitary Freikor units. During the clash, 156 insurgents and 17 Freikor soldiers were killed. Liebknecht and Luxembourg had fled but were tracked down and arrested and then handed over to the largest Freikor unit. On the evening of the 15th of January, after initially being questioned, both were beaten unconscious with rifle butts and shot in the head. The Spartacists uprising had come to an end. One of, thing of significance to bear in mind in terms of Nazi ideology, beliefs and propaganda and how they manipulated it in relation to the Spartacist uprising was that Luxembourg, at least, was Jewish. There seems to be some debate and uncertainty over Liebknecht's heritage, but the general consensus is that he wasn't Jewish. Prior to Hitler's effort in 1923, there had been another attempt at a putsch during the early beginnings of Weimar. Wolfgang Kapp, a Prussian civil servant, journalist and ardent nationalist, and Walter von Ludwitz, a World War I general, incited a coup on the 13th of March 1920 that aimed to overflow, overthrow sorry, the Weimar Republic, establish a right-wing autocratic government and ultimately undo the revolution. The putsch was named after Kapp, although really in the end he only played a supporting role, despite having been planning a coup for a while. This attempt was instigated by the military and the former World War I general von Ludwitz. Uh, he was the main driving force behind the coup. The putsches took control of Berlin, forcing the government to flee first to Dresden before being moved to Stuttgart, where they were taken into protective custody under the orders of the new provisional government in Berlin, which was headed by Kapp as Chancellor, while Ludwitz was commander of the armed forces alongside Minister of Defence. But the legitimate government, being held in protective custody, retaliated by calling on German workers to embark on a general strike in order to defeat the putsch. Many supported and responded to the call, with the strike starting on the 14th of March, and on the 15th, it spread to all parts of the Reich. Around 12 million workers were involved, making it the most powerful strike in German history. The country was paralysed. Berlin alone had gas, water and power supplies stopped. And as a result of the strike, Germany, ca Germany came to a virtual standstill, and as a result, Kapp and Ludwitz were unable to govern. Even threats of capital punishment did not deter the workers from continuing the strike. Four days after it had begun, on the 17th of March, the put collapsed. Kapp and Ludwitz resigned after the four big centre-right parties, the Social Democratic, Zentrum, German People's Party and German National People's Party, offered along with fresh elections amnesty for all participants in the putsch. The people had stood with and backed the government, defeating a big threat from the extreme right. But Weimar's problems were still far from over. Another big threat to Weimar to try and tackle was hyperinflation. Inflation soared in the early post-war years at a galloping pace. The government just printed more money to try and pay its debts. By late 1922, Germany had begun to default on some of its reparations payments after the government claimed that it could no longer afford them. The French and Belgian delegates of the Reparations Commission urged the occupying of the Ruhr Valley, at that time Germany's most productive industrial region, as an alternate way to extract reparations. But the British, de British delegate urged for payments to be lowered in order to help Germany to keep to the terms of Versailles and maintain its reparations payments whilst all prevent also preventing it from econom economically completely collapsing. But French and Belgian troops occupied the Ruhr in January 1923. 
However, French Premier Raymond Poincaré was reluctant to order the occupation and only proceeded after the British rejected proposals for non-military sanctions against Germany. The Ruhr remained under French occupation until August 1925, but the situation only further increased German anger and bitterness towards the French, which continued to simmer over the following years. The occupation took control of most of the mining and manufacturing companies. Germany's response? Strikes were called, lasting eight months and damaging the economy even more. Because striking workers were paid benefits by the state, a lot more additional currency was printed, which fuelled hyperinflation. Come 1923, a loaf of bread could cost 100 billion marks. A newspaper could cost 50,000 marks in the morning, but by the evening it would have soared to 100,000 marks. Basically, the mark as a currency was now worthless. At the beginning of September 1923, Exchange rates in Germany reached 10 million Reichsmarks for one US dollar. But in November the same year, a new currency, the Renten Mark, was introduced and it ends hyperinflation and reparations payments resume once more. Despite enormous pressure from within and numerous attempts to bring the Republic down and democracy with it, Weimar held on for 14 years, I be it, albeit, sorry, with the last four years seeing an increasingly rapid downward spiral ending in dictatorship and totalitarianism. Weimar did achieve success amongst the threats of revolution, Bolshevism and political extremism from both the left and right wing. It survived two putsch attempts early on. 1924 to 1929 was known as the Golden Era and saw a growing economy along with a downturn in civil unrest. There were social reforms, introduction of unemployment relief and improvement in benefits, increase of housing construction, extension of health insurance coverage, protection for workers, a Bill of Rights guaranteed every German citizen freedom of speech and religion and equality under the law. All men and women over the age of 20 were given the vote. This was even better than Britain, as only women over 30 were allowed to vote here. Despite its turbulent and nervy beginning, Germany did begin to settle down somewhat under the Weimar Republic and the people were able to experience some sort of stabilisation. It was shaky, its immediate future was uncertain, Overall, it wouldn't have taken much force against the door for the whole, ha whole house to start collapsing in on itself. But there were some positives to take from the Weimar Republic, and if it had been allowed to find its feet some more and become properly settled, had it been given more time, then it's possible that it would have taken Germany down a different path in history. With no crises to manipulate, no desperation amongst the population due to hunger, the economy, employment, etc., to connect with, Hitler was unable to thrive and could not have the effect that he desired. In a time of stability, food and employment, the German people basically didn't really need Hitler and his extremism. There was nothing to confront, no anger, no despair. The Nazis still had dedicated followers who shared their views, particularly those anti-Semitic in nature. But overall, only in times of peril and chaos, with a want for action and a fast way to deal with the problem, did people turn to figures such as Hitler and the Nazis. As in situations such as this, they seemed to offer the perfect solution that could be implemented quickly. In a nutshell, extreme times called for extreme measures. If it had not been for the events into the latter part of the 1920s, and as a result, if Weimar had been able to continue building on its progress, then in all probability, Hitler would have faded into obscurity and history would have been very different. With significant aid from American loans, the Weimar Republic had the ability to work towards a better, more peaceful future for Germany. Despite fairly faint protests and rantings in the background from the extreme right, indeed the future seemed to be looking up. But the American loans, meant to help Germany rebuild and work towards a better future, ironically ended up contributing to Weimar's failure. Tragically, for millions of people, democracy in Germany was hit hard by events out of its control and ultimately people felt that it had failed them. It was then that they turned to the Nazis for an answer to the new problem. In October 1929, America's Wall Street stock market crashed, triggering what became known as the Great Depression, which lasted for 12 years and spread across the world. The depression was the result of the crash, but the crash was the result of a combination of things that occurred in the years prior, from around 1926. In Germany, there was particular discontent and frustration amongst farmers and middle class. These areas were already in economic difficulties by the end of 1927, as a worldwide agricultural depression began, and since 1924 had seen a shift in the economic focus moving towards big businesses and organised labour. The discontent amongst the rural population began to spread in 1927 and 1928. One of its main grievances was the belief that it was grossly overtaxed, especially compared to civil servants. Rural wanted to see an end to the privileged treatment of the civil servants and to be provided with access to cheap credit to enable them to work towards wiping out their debts. For the farmers and middle class, parli for the farmers and middle class, 
parliamentarism sorry, was corrupt and weak, therefore unable to overcome Germany's political and economic problems. Hitler and the Nazis had recognised opportunities for exploitation of the farmers' plight and were quick to jump on it, as a result of which Hitler began to be seen as the only salvation from the parliamentary morass. Overproduction of agricultural produce created widespread financial despair amongst American farmers between the end of the war and the crash. It would later be blamed as one of the key factors that led to the events of October 1929. Many believed that the stock market would continue to rise, though. On the 25th of March 1929, the Federal Reserve warned against excessive speculation, though. There was a mini-crash as investors started to rapidly sell stocks, early warnings of what was to come seven months later. The American economy was showing ominous signs of trouble. There was a decline of steel production, sluggish construction, down sales of cars, consumers building up high debts due to, due to easy credit. However, stocks recovered in June and gains continued until September 1929. By early September, a number of financial experts were predicting that a crush was coming. But whilst there were jitters and uneasiness over the situation's increase in development, it seems that there were still many who didn't think that there was cause for any excessive degree of alarm. The market would correct itself. On the 20th of September 1929, the London Stock Exchange crashed, which weakened the optimism of American investment in markets overseas. Leading up to that crash, the market had been severely unstable, although there were brief periods of rising prices and recovery. The world's economy was starting to wobble. On the 24th of October, known as Black Thursday, the slide downhill began in earnest. The selling of stocks intensified and panic started to set in. Over the following few days after the implementing of certain measures by some of the leading Wall Street bankers in an attempt to stop the slide, the markets rallied. But it wasn't to last. On Black Tuesday, the 29th of October, panic selling reached its peak and $14 billion was lost on this day alone. Between Monday the 28th and Tuesday the 29th of October, over $30 billion was lost. The market continued to fall over the course of the following weeks, hitting bottom in mid-November. The effects of the crash were felt throughout Europe and Germany was one of the worst nations here. The country's heavy dependence on American finances had been dangerous and it was now paying a very heavy price. As a result of America withdrawing the loans that had been supporting the economy, unemployment in Germany started to rise fast. By 1930, it stood somewhere in the region of 4 million. Things started to disintegrate and fast, and this time there would be nothing that would be able to help pull back from the brink. The crash wasn't the only factor that caused Weimar to ultimately fail, but it played a very significant part as the sudden withdrawal of the very supporting funds hit the economy devastatingly hard, which then heavily affected unemployment, and this in turn had a knock-on effect for everything else. It may not have been immediately obvious at this point, but democracy was over. Hitler's time had now come. Would Weimar have lasted had it not been for the Wall Street crash? I personally think that it would have stood a good chance had it been allowed to continue with its progress and given more time to stabilise further. After all, it had survived two putsch attempts and various threats of revolution from within, but ultimately it was a catalyst which originated on the other side of the world that ended its chances. It was by no means perfect, but it was steering in the right direction and was attempting to make life better and proper, prosperous for all its citizens regardless of their standing. In such stable, in such stable, sorry, and encouragingly prosperous times, the country did not need the likes of Hitler. Could Weimar have been too ambitious in its attempts at making a real-life utopia? Perhaps. But if Weimar had been able to flourish more, been given a chance, then maybe the people would not have turned to the Nazis for the answers to their troubles. I'm Lucy and I am the creator of World War II Boffin. I hope you found the content of the talk that you've just been listening to interesting. If you would like to delve into the subject in a little bit more detail in your own time, then what I've done to hopefully aid you with that is in the description box below the video, I have listed some sources that are related to the subject that I think you'll find interesting. So do look those up uh, if you would like to. Just a clarification on the channel in general, this video and all the videos that are going to follow, I am not and do not claim to be an official historian. I am simply an individual who has got a passionate interest in my chosen subject and the whole purpose of the channel and its videos is simply to share my passion with others who have got a similar interest. So that's all it is. I'm not professional and I don't represent any professional organisation. To round the video off, and this will also be included in uh, future videos, I'm going to do two things. One, we're going to have a Boffin Reader's Corner, which is basically me recommending a book on the subject to you that I think you'll find helpful and interesting. 
and then finally I'm going to do a boffin show and tell. I can I collect all manner of artifacts connected to the war and for this last section what I'm going to do is I'm just going to choose one or two items from my collection to share with you, uh, give you a little bit of information about them and I hope you find that uh, to be of interest as well. So the reader's corner, first recommendation for you. As this is the first entry uh, I thought a good place to start would be recommending a book to you that has a that goes through the overall history of the war. There's an awful lot of history uh, on the Second World War, sorry, there's an awful lot of literature on the war out there. There's always more coming as well, all the time. Uh, we're almost literally drowning in, in the amount of literature that is out there. So if you're just starting out on the subject or you've got a little bit of knowledge and are looking to enhance that further, it can be a little bit daunting as to where to start with your reading. So an overall history of the Second World War is a pretty good place to start. Now there's a number out there and most of them are very very good. They tend to range from lengthwise from being a couple of hundred pages long. Uh, they're literally just meant to be a very brief outline of the history of the war as a starting point. Uh, and then at the other end you've got ones that are somewhere in the region of 800 to even a thousand pages, great big tombs, uh, and they can be a little bit daunting if you're just starting out. So for this first recommendation for you I've gone for something somewhere in the middle and that is Andrew Roberts' The Storm of War. Now this was one of the very first books that I ever read on the subject and I've gone back to it a couple of times. It is a really good read. Uh, it's 600 pages long so you might find that initially a little bit ooh, but believe me it's really easy to get into, a very easy read and extremely informative so I would highly recommend it. There's a good number of photos in there as well, they're split into three different sections. Uh, you'll find that the more books you read on the war you'll come across um, a lot of familiar photos. There are standard photos that get used in an awful lot of uh, publications but in every single book that I've got on the war and all that I've read there are always new images as well. There are always new finds and they, that is always of great interest. So you will say come across familiar photos an awful lot but you'll always find new treasures as well in whatever book that you read. Uh, so yeah, as a starting point, if you're looking for somewhere to kick off and enhance your knowledge that way, I would definitely recommend Andrew Roberts' The Storm of War. I'll put an Amazon link in the description box below the video for you as well, uh, so that you can go and take a look in a little bit more detail. Finally, show and tell. Uh, as mentioned, I collect all manner of artefacts connected to the war. All the images that you saw in the video that accompanied the talk, they are all of items from my own collection. Uh, so I figured it would be a pretty good place to start to show you a couple of these. So, and this is the first one. So this is the first image that you would have seen on the video. It's of a war memorial, a German war memorial for the town of, now I'm going to try and pronounce this but I might not necessarily get it right so do bear with me. It is the town of Heckingen, I think that's right which is a town in Baden-Württemberg, which is in southwest Germany. As you can see, there's two. There's a wall either side of the cross, and that has got the names of all the dead, I believe, from that particular town. So it's actually a postcard rather than a photo. Um, well, an actual photo, I mean. Uh, I found that when looking for particular items for my collection, especially on the German side, there's an awful lot of postcard albums. Uh, from the period that show various images and they're extremely interesting. Um, I've got a couple of fairly thick um, albums myself and there's an awful lot of content on, in them that are of, of particular interest and the type of images tend to vary. Uh, but this is an example of one of the items from the very first postcard album, German postcard album, that I ever bought. Um, and it's a really interesting image I think and a very sombre one as well uh, because obviously it's one of the co permanent reminders out there all over Europe of and obviously the world as well as to the number of people who lost their lives both in the Second World War, the First World War and all other conflicts that have come before and after as well. So it's quite a sombre image but I thought it was a pretty good one uh, to use in this uh, starting video. So I'm not too sure exactly when it was taken, there's no date on the postcard as such but it was probably I would imagine fairly soon after the First World War. So that's your first one for you. 
this is another image that was used uh, later in the video. What I'm going to do is, with all these items, I'm going to post some photos on the Facebook page for you as well, uh, some close-ups so that you can take a look at them in a little bit more detail than what you can see on this video, uh, but just to give you an overall view of them at the moment. Now, this is a British postcard. Uh, it was made by, bear with me just one second, the Banforth & Co Limited Publishing Company. Uh, not sure how old it is because again there's no date on it but I think it must have been fairly soon after the end of the war and it depicts the British army marching off into the distance to the fight and there is a picture of Jesus up the top there obviously symbolising those who unfortunately lost their lives uh, during the fighting and there is a verse from the hymn God be with you till we meet again down the bottom there as well so it's in pretty good condition considering how old it must be I'll just show you the back uh, it's a little bit brown and aged, needless to say, because as I say, I think it must be a relatively old postcard. Uh, it's a little bit frayed and worn around the edges as well, but overall, uh, it's one of the better conditioned items that I've got in my collection. Uh, so, there's that one. And then, I've got these. That are posters from the Weimar Republic era. Now, these are not the original posters. Uh, they're pretty rare to come across. These are prints, so I should emphasise that. Uh, they're not original posters, they're prints, but they're professional prints uh, from the original um, item. So, And they're pretty good prints as well, so they will seem to be suitable to put in this first entry and of good quality to do so. So this is a political poster from the Weimar Republic, and the translation, you bear with me while I just get my notes up. There we go. Sorry, bear with me just one second. So this translates to the National Assembly, the cornerstone of the German Socialist Republic. So that's one of the posters from Weimar there for you. This next one, I couldn't get the translation for this, unfortunately. But uh, there you go, there's a picture of it. This is a anti-Bolshevism post poster. Uh, again, it's from the Weimar Republic looks quite intimidating to say the least. As I say, unfortunately, I couldn't get the translation for it, so I'm not entirely sure what it says, but going by the photo alone, I think you can uh, guess it's meant to be pretty intimidating. And then finally, again, this is another poster from the Weimar Republic. And again, I'm just gonna get my translation for the text back for you, so bear with me. Ah, dear, right, and there we go. Pretty colorful poster, as you can see. And the translation on that reads peace, freedom, prosperity, choose the republic. Obviously very heavy on the propaganda there. Uh, I'm not too sure what dates on any of these posters are unfortunately but they've got to be pretty early on I would imagine uh, when Weimar was in its very turbulent beginnings uh, so obviously it seemed to be an encouragement to support the republic uh, and to defer from Bolshevism uh, to scare people away from Bolshevism basically so uh, yeah as I mentioned it's prints, not the original posters, but very good prints, uh, so it's a handy thing to have in the collection. That's it, that's where we finish. So as I say, I hope you found the video in general to be of interest, and I hope you're going to join in uh, for the next one. For the next episode, we're going to take a look at some of the later origins of an event connected to World War II. Uh, we're going to be starting in 1933, Hitler's rise to power um, and becoming Chancellor, through to the beginning of September 1939, which was, of course, uh, the German march into Poland, kicking off the Second World War. Uh, so that'll be next month. I hope you'll join me then. Uh, and as I say, I hope you found this to be, uh, all to be of interest. Uh, so look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, bye-bye.